Welcome to a Rice University podcast. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. So welcome uh, to the 28th annual Bachler Lecture, uh, an event that commemorates the great polymath Solomon Bachner, who founded Ciencia. Uh, my name is Susan McIntosh. I'm the director of Ciencia. And the Bachner Lecture is the centerpiece of our annual lecture series, which we organize thematically, which permits us to draw together uh, speakers from engineering, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and humanities. And our aim at Ciencia is to promote discussion, both in the question period that follows the lectures and in the receptions afterwards, and reinforce a sense of the university as a community joined by an engagement with ideas and the production of knowledge. This year's theme of failure was proposed by our members and fellows, but it was prominently shaped by an article entitled The Virtues of Failure, written by today's speaker. And the key conclusion of his short commentary was this, the smart researcher uses failure as a powerful, but often secret tool for finding success. His article describes the research enterprise as, quote, a comedy of errors in which one thing goes wrong after another. And he goes on to paraphrase Winston Churchill, noting that research progress consists of staggering from one failure to the next with undiminished enthusiasm. I hope you're all recognizing yourself in these descriptions. Clearly, Richard Zare has, in his own research, fashioned this endless stream of errors into successes of extraordinary magnitude. He is with us en route to Saudi Arabia to accept the King Faisal Prize, International Science Prize, and we're exceptionally grateful that he has been able to be here given the schedule for the awards ceremony. I've asked Neil Lane, uh, Malcolm Gillis University professor and professor of physics and astronomy and a longtime colleague and associate of Dick Zares to introduce him. Neil? Thank you very much. It is a, really a great pleasure for me to introduce a very old, uh, not so very old actually, but a uh, <laughs> friend and colleague uh, and one of the world's preeminent chemists. Professor Richard Zare. Uh, Dick Zare was born and raised in Ohio. He obtained his degrees from Harvard. His PhD thesis advisor was Nobel laureate Dudley Hirschbach. And Dick held early faculty appointments in chemistry and physics and astrophysics at the University of Colorado, where he was also a fellow of the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics. Now it's called JILA, and that's where our paths first crossed. Uh, he uh, joined Columbia University as a full professor in 1969 before settling in at Stanford in 1977. In 2005, he was named chair of Stanford's chemistry department, and in 2006 was uh, named the Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor. Uh, he currently is a Margaret Blake Wilbur professor of natural science. Dick Zare is famous for many discoveries and advances in the field of laser chemistry. Particularly noteworthy was his development of the technique called laser-induced fluorescence, a powerful spectroscopic tool that's widely used today by chemists across the globe. It has many applications, including such things as uranium isotope separation, detection of short-lived unstable radicals, observation of single molecules and single molecule collisions. And in fact, uh, Dick's first molecule, I guess, uh, was the uh, potassium dimer, K2, in which he observed uh, Vibration and rotation levels have never been seen before, and by interpreting those, he was really able to understand the long-range forces between potassium atoms uh, in ways that people simply did not know. I think the real power of his technique is the sensitivity, and I understand uh, that one can now count the copy numbers of proteins in a single cell. So later, if you bring your cells down, I'm sure you'd <laughs> be happy to count some. Dick Zare's list of honors is awesome. For research accomplishments, he's been awarded over 50, five zero medals and prizes. If he were to wear them all, he could not stand before <laughs> us today. And these include top awards from the American Physical Society, American Chemical Society, American Academy of Sciences, U.S. government, and other institutions. I'll mention just three, 
explicitly, the National Medal of Science, which you received in 1983, the highest scientific honor made, uh, awarded by the United States government, the Welch Award in Chemistry, as you know, uh, awarded by the Robert A. Welch Foundation, has a Texas connection, and uh, he is on his way, if you just heard, to receive the uh, King Faisal International Prize in Science. Uh, in addition, Dick has received over half a dozen awards for his teaching of chemistry, including the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, which he received from President Obama in 2009. I know Dick Tapia is here who has won that award as well. Dick holds 10 honorary doctorates from universities in the U.S. and around the world. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Philosophical Society, and many other prestigious scholarly institutions. He is foreign member of the Royal Society of London, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Indian Academy of Sciences, World Jewish Academy of Sciences, and the Swedish Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences. He's authored over 800 papers, five books, holds more than 50 patents. In addition to being a great scientist, he is what I like to call a civic scientist, as not only has he contributed to advancing the field of chemistry, through his path-breaking discoveries and prize-winning teaching, he has also engaged in public young and old discussions about science and served as a reviewer and advisor to the federal government, the national academies, many other institutions and governments all across the globe. At one point in his career, he was chairman of the National Science Board, a high-level advisory body appointed by the president that shares policy-making authority with the director of the National Science Foundation. As it turns out, I was director of the National Science Foundation when Dick chaired the board. Now, if the chairman of the board and the director do not get along, it's very hard to get anything done. Well, Dick's approach, I'm happy to tell you, was to offer good advice and support and let the director run the foundation. This gives me an opportunity to say publicly how much I appreciate that and that I could not have wished for a better chairman. I am eternally grateful for that. So thank you very much, Dick. Uh, this afternoon, Dick Zare is going to explain to us how good can come from failure, at least in chemistry. I can say from experience, uh, my experience in the chemistry laboratory, that I actually did quite a lot of good when I was a young uh, student, but it was not appreciated by my labby instructor. So maybe we will hear different examples today. The title of Dick's lecture is The Power of a Failed Lecture Demonstration. Enhancing Learning from Unexpected Outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Stanford's Professor Richard Zaire. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Thank you all. Hope you can all hear me. Sounds good. I think got the, the, this, this working well. And uh, of course, I, I start with a question. <laughs> Why is it that when you organized a symposium on failure that you immediately thought to invite me? <laughs> but, but I appreciate it. There's, there's, some, there's some reasons to it. Uh, I, I am serious about how actually the importance of getting used to failure. And so I'll, I'll be, start something before we even start this talk. Uh, if you want to do research, you want to discover things, you go and hit your head against the wall, then you turn around and you hit your head against another wall, etc. You keep on stumbling around to trying to make things work. If you are in constant judgment of yourself, I failed, oh, they, oh, they know I failed, I can't continue, you can't do research. You instead have to uh, look at you know, the sound that the wall makes when you hit it. Maybe there's a clue here, <laughs> what I can do next, what's behind the wall. And you need that. You, so you, you need very much to take the attitude of, of persevering. And you can't persevere at something unless you're passionate about it. So it has to be worth uh, the candle, worth the price of, of, of going after something. And I thought I'd mention that to begin with about failure. But I'm going to speak to you about a different type of failure. Uh, let's, let's begin, if I can. Let's see, how does this work? Um, we don't care about wireless networks. Does that go? Okay, here we go. <laughs> right? Um, all types of failures, right? <laughs> I remember once when I decided to 
make a cloud of smoke for my lecture demonstration, and the smoke was so thick that everyone fled the auditorium. <laughs> so we've all had various types of things. And I want to talk about enhanced learning through unexpected results. Um, but let, let, let's, let's then begin. Let's do that. Snap, crackle, and pop. The role of laboratories and demonstrations in science instruction. Is that what they're about? Some people think that unless it's all entertainment full of snap, crackle, and pop, there's nothing more worth doing. I disagree strongly. Oh, so sure, some of that's remembered, the flash, the bang. Uh, but there's more to it that gets us excited about what, what we do in going on. I think I should talk about, again, here, a bit of philosophy behind teaching, at least my own. You might think that teaching involves conveying information. This is true, but believe it or not, various search engines are much better at conveying information than I am, <laughs> okay, for, for sure. Um, and as you know from the search engines, some of that's wrong too, but still better. <laughs> uh, it's not about information, it's about inspiration. The real teacher is the person who can inspire you why you want to learn something. Because you can learn anything you want, but why would you bother to learn this? And that's the real role of teaching in this. And demonstrations are, to me, really important. Let, let, let's go on. Uh, here's the good news. Labs have advantages. I'll get back so I can see this. What else? Hands-on experience, right? You really get to do that with, with your hands. Learn the use and handling of equipment. That's practical. Uh, the, and you can't learn that by reading from a book. Let, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. No one has ever learned how to play the piano by reading a book entitled How to Play the Piano. Okay? You have to play. <laughs> you have to try. Uh, and believe me, if you play any musical instrument, you better get used to failure, too, as you master it, if you want to go on. Um, develop strategies for independent research. You're really on your own and forced to think of things. Learn to focus on observation. It's the beginning, what you observe and making sense of it. To me, that's what science is about, interpreting it and so forth. Learn to deal with uncertainty. Just like failure, you've got to get used to uncertainty. If you're not uh, what I call a contented schizophrenic, <laughs> at the same time, making up stories why something may be so, and then questioning how, what nonsense I just made up. <laughs> you need that. You need that. You need to be both. If you err on one side or the other, you fail. But let me explain. I know people who are really cr critical about writing. They're so critical about writing that they themselves can't write. They can only tell you what's wrong with whatever, whatever it is you wrote or someone else's wrote. Don't want to be that way. And I've seen other people who are in a world of fantasy. They so believe anything they say, they can't check it against reality. That's, of course, the greatest way that I think science goes wrong is through self-delusion of one sort or another. You need both. You need to be able to propose things and then question it. And that's where this failure part is really a guide post for success and what happens. So you have to learn to deal with uncertainty and it allows personal discovery and you learn to distinguish fact and interpretation when you do experimental work. Uh, it, it hits you over the head <laughs> that way, I think. Uh, when well done, okay, positive lab experiences are some of the best remembered teaching experiences. They can be most decisive in choosing a career in the sciences. The reason I personally went into the sciences is, in terms of physical sciences is because I had an experience around junior year in which I could do something with my hands and think about it with my mind and it meant some, made some sense. It happened in an industrial setting. But, and, I, and I also have had experiences in labs as an undergrad. Because one of the questions that we're going to come up with, I think, later to talk about is, is what do we do about lab experiences for undergrads? I'm just put, put, planning this idea in your mind we should return to. But OK, so we see something about good news. Is it all good news? No. <laughs> Bad news. <laughs> Labs have disadvantages. Let's go through the disadvantages. They are costly. 
ask any dean or provost, <laughs> or chair of the department too, for that matter. They do cost money, right, to put things together. Uh, they are time consuming. Oh, I gotta spend n hours more in lab, right? Uh, faculty often view labs as the domain of teaching assistants. This is real. And this is universal, <laughs> from what I can tell, <laughs> in many cases. What else? Worse still, laboratory exercises are often what you call cookbook, cookbook activities that keep students very busy, but do not acquaint students with the discipline and the experience of true investigation. The worst type, okay? Uh, I came, I come now <coughs> from a university in which one of the clever people before me figured that he could save huge amounts of money, <coughs> pardon me, by um, eliminating freshman chemistry labs. That's what happened. It saved lots of money. It really decreased the number of people planning to go on in chemistry. <laughs> because again, without that experience, why would you want to do this? Well, what is the point, et cetera? And I think you need these things. You need to have some experience one way or the other. Uh, it isn't enough just about, you, you, let me try again. What person has ever chose a career based on a scintillating question on a final exam? Or a great homework problem? No one, <laughs> just about no one, right? But a lab experience, that can make the difference. Or things that related to it, science fair or whatever, that matters. That's so important, that's what we're talking about. Uh, okay, this is from my, my, my mentor that you heard about, Dudley Hirschbach, and I, I'd like to read this to you, because I like it so much. Too often, laboratory work in typical general chemistry courses has a ritualistic character. Students follow a carefully specified protocol enshrined in a laboratory manual and interpreted or reinforced by pronouncements from priest-like figures garbed in white coats, the teaching fellows. This fosters slavish imitation and timidity rather than the self-reliant, innovative, experimental spirit that is the essence of science. I think that's well put. Okay. The role of the lecture demonstrations, because you don't have to just have labs, you can do things in lecture too. And here we are, this person's about to do a lecture demonstration. I like this cartoon. And here he is, and there they are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I could do some lecture demonstrations for you now, but I thought instead I'd bring along videos. It's, it's much safer today with TSA <laughs> to do this. <laughs> but I, I bring you this quote, one of my favorites. <laughs> and this, the way to capture a student's attention is with a demonstration where there's a possibility the teacher may die. Okay? Now, this is asking a lot from the faculty, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from Gerald Walker, professor of physics at Cleveland State. Um, and uh, uh, here's one ultimate demonstration, to walk on burning coals and not get burnt. Just for fun, anybody in this room who's walked on burning coals? Okay, now, might have got a different answer if I'd gone to India <laughs> or elsewhere, but I, hopefully you've all seen pictures. If not, check them out on YouTube. People can do this, they really do. Uh, how is this possible? Okay, here are some possible explanations, and they all make some sense, but I'm going to save the most important for last. The dry wood coals conduct heat very poorly. The coal itself may be very hot, but it will not transfer that heat to something touching it. There's a conduction problem, okay? The coals are a very uneven surface. The actual surface area, in, in, you know, in contact with the foot is not much, so you don't get much heat transfer. Wood coals have a very low heat capacity, so it doesn't take much to cool them down. <laughs> and although they are very hot, there's actually not much heat energy to be transferred to the foot. Fire walkers do not spend very much time on the coals. If you've noticed, this is true. <laughs> and if they don't keep moving, they're in trouble. <laughs> Deep trouble, okay? What else? <laughs> Blood is a good conductor of heat. Yeah, it is. It is circulating and pumping through. And uh, if I had to walk on coals, I'd be pumping pretty fast. <laughs> right? And now comes actually, I think, uh, the most important effect. It's called the Leidenfrost effect. 
And it's this, when a cold, wet object, like a sweaty foot, <laughs> touches a hot, dry object, like a burning coal, the water vaporizes. And it turns out that, that gas, particularly water vapor, is a barrier and it's poorly conducting. So poorly conducting steam between the hot and the cold objects, you can't get heat transferred much at all. So if you sweat a lot, <laughs> it's actually, and, and this helps particularly if you're terrified, <laughs> you can run through coals. and works out quite well. Uh, here, I want to read some more. This is from Cecil Adams, the straight dope, but I read this to you. I've just spoken to my bud, Gerald Walker, the former Scientific American columnist, and as it turns out, the G. Gordon Liddy of physics, <laughs> has a classroom demo of the Leidenfrost effect. Gerald not only walked on hot coals, he gave it up after getting badly burned once. He was so cool and his feet didn't get sufficiently damp. <laughs> he also dips his bare hand in water, right? And then plunges it momentarily into a vat of molten lead, 700 degrees Celsius. Says Gerald, who's even done this on the Johnny Carson show, there's no classroom demonstration so riveting as one in which the teacher may die. <laughs> Back to that again. Well, can you do something else? Okay, you're shaking your head. I feel the same way. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta have something else. I, I have a challenge. One of the challenges I had at Stanford was to teach a course in which um, everybody in the course had AP5, Advanced Placement 5 in Chemistry. They were there taking general chemistry Many of them actually didn't want to take general chemistry. They thought they should be taking some other course because they'd finished with general chemistry. And it was up to me to show them there's still more to learn at the college level and to get them interested. And I have to give the first lecture to this group. Uh, and, uh, I picked something. I would do a lecture demonstration, which I'm going to get to, the electrolysis of water. And we're going to go through this. This is my favorite failed lecture demonstration. And notice, I put failed in quotes. Now, look, I've had lecture demonstrations that have truly failed. Uh, I mean, I, I'm serious. One time, I was giving a lecture about bonding in chemistry, in which I talked about positive nuclei and negative electrons and how they attracted each other. And I wanted to show Coulomb forces. And, and I had their balloons, and I had fur, and I had various things. And whatever I did that day and rubbed it together, all the balloons repelled each other. <laughs> uh, this led to a discussion of whether or not this was causing the expanding universe, which is, which is not what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> it may not happen to you, <laughs> but you always take your, 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 hand, you know, your life at risk here with these, some of these lecture demonstrations as to how they turn out. Uh, it's OK. Anyways, this is my favorite failed one. Hydrogen reacts with oxygen to produce water and energy. Uh, and here I could have carried, you know, some balloons and blown them up for you. Probably you've all done that, or heard that, and bang. And we get water out, and we got lots of energy by burning hydrogen and oxygen uh, to do this and flying. Now, that's going in this direction, OK? Here's the two hydrogens. Here's the one oxygen to make H2O, 2H2O. This is balanced, right? Or you can turn it around the other way. With the addition of energy, you can drive this process backwards. And water can be decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, agreed? That's electrolysis. And so I would set up electrolysis for people. And here's the setup I would use. This is the classic Hoffman electrolysis cell. Now look, here's platinum foil, a cathode, an anode. I attach them to a DC battery. Now, if you do it with AC, then half the time it's an anode, half the time it's a cathode, I get a mixture of H2 and O2, and that's not a good idea, <laughs> as I'll show you because, of, because I mix things up then. This way I have only one side does one, one side does the other, and I'm doing this in these burettes. Here's water, and this is all controlled. And here's the electrolysis process. Water is oxidized at the anode. And oxidized means loses electrons. See the electron loss? It forms 4H plus and O2 and four electrons come off to go in. And water is reduced at the cathode. Here's the reduction process. Okay? Reduction means you gain electrons. See, 4OH minus and 2H2 
come from this. Let me add this balanced equation to this balanced equation to get an overall balanced equation. And I see I get 6H2O goes to 2H2 plus O2, and I have this stuff which is acid and base, okay, H plus and OH minus. And um, by adding the acid base indicator to an unbuffered electrolyte such as sodium sulfate, it's easily seeing that the water near the anode is acidified, whereas the water near the cathode is made basic. You can do that with pH indicators, and it's a lovely demo that I could have tried to bring for you. Uh, I, I just didn't. Okay, and here it is set up, and I've, I've done this. It's easy to do, nine volt battery, and pieces of, of lead in a pencil. Lead, remember, is really graphite <laughs> for pencils. Okay, and easy to do. And here's a failed demos, okay? Here's the actual setup, and I want to show you. If you watch this thing run, watch. See it go down? Look, this is the hydrogen side. Here's the oxygen side. And you can prove that because often you'd open this burette and you'd take a, a lit a match and you'd see that when you put it on that side, you get a pink flame, which is the bomber emission lines of hydrogen. And you knew that was hydrogen. And on this side, if you took your, your, your match and you opened it up to oxygen, it really flared up. It really liked to burn, it, right? But you, 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 you see, people are happy. But then you look at this in more detail. Look at it in more detail. Do you see this volume here? And do you see this volume here? The volume ratio of H2 to O2 is not 2 to 1. It's much larger than 2 to 1. It's maybe 4 to 1 or 5 to 1. Ah. Why, I asked my class. And generally, my class looked rather perplexed when I asked this question, because they all thought they knew the lecture at this point was so dull, so obvious what was happening. And why? Uh, why? Uh, I suggested that maybe in Palo Alto, the water is actually H5O or some <laughs> other, <laughs> not H2O. And I pointed out to them that historically, it was very happy that the com law of combining proportions, et cetera, was not figured out this way. <laughs> Take a long time. Um, so mystery, huh? And I, I began to get more interested in this. And I, I wanted to share with you what's going on, um, if I might. And I guess it's like the movie again, just showing the movie. You can really see the difference that it makes. OK, enough of that. Ignorance is bliss. First of all, if you use copper, the effect is really big. If you don't bother to use platinum, it's even more than, than four to one. It gets much higher. But then if you look at the copper electrodes, the one around where oxygen is evolving, you see it's turned black, copper oxide. So you said, aha, copper's been removed. But with platinum, platinum's inert. That isn't the answer. That's not the answer. What is it? And it's actually differential solubilities of the two gases, which you don't first think about. At least I didn't. And the solubility of H2 and O2 in, the, in, this, in, the, in, in water at 20 degrees centigrade are 18 milliliters per liter and 31 milliliters per liter. And when you start right at the beginning, you haven't produced much. The water is all pure. It's not saturated with these gases. You don't get 2 to 1. You have to run for a while to ever get 2 to 1. So you'll, you'll see various discussions about how you get two to one, but they don't tell you this in their textbooks at all. <laughs> I just don't know generally what's going on. And I found this interesting. And it's a good way to start to get the class to realize observation and a lot of thoughts required to interpret the world around us. Um, and there I've explained this difference. So I don't need to state it again. Um, now, time out. Some personal stories of my efforts to find a teachable moment, uh, if I might. These are really things that happened to me. They're all related, unfortunately, to my daughters. I have three of them going to high school and taking chemistry. None of my daughters would ever become chemists. <laughs> and I think you're going to start to see why. <laughs> OK. Um, first daughter just had no interest in chemistry, got AP5 in physics, went off to the University, University of Southern California, the physics department called me up with great excitement because was this person really related to me? It seemed to be. 
and I said, you'll never see her. She's going there to play the French horn. <laughs> they never did. Well, how could she get AP5 in physics? I said, I've asked her the same question. And she said to me, physics is so logical, you don't need to know much to work out problems. But chemistry is impossible. <laughs> so <laughs> not helpful <laughs> for me at all. <laughs> said, OK, no interest in that. Uh, my middle daughter, this is Bonnie. Now, that was, Rachel, that was Bethany, my first one. My middle daughter, Bonnie, came home. I think I'll tell you Rachel first. My, this is my youngest daughter. What are you doing, Rachel, I asked. And she's there with um, wires and beads. And she's busy putting beads onto wires and making some crazy loopy pattern. And I said, what is it you're doing? She says, the teacher's given us these wires and beads and told us to make a magnesium atom in the form of the... <laughs> But you know, the Atomic Energy Commission symbol of these <laughs> beads and how many beads you put, one per. And here I thought I recognized a teachable moment. Oh, is I wrong? Why? You'll hear, you'll hear. So I said, look, look, no, no, this doesn't make sense, I told her. This is not the way to look at the problem at all. I said, let's talk about what the hydrogen atom is like. And I said, really, I can't show you the right model because the nucleus is so heavy compared to the electron. I just don't have something that I can put together that shows you this. But let's get a ball bearing. And we're going to put this ball bearing, I said, which is the nucleus, inside a big ball of cotton <laughs> that was spherical. And I explained to her how this ball of cotton was because we don't know where the electron is <laughs> in the 1s orbital of the hydrogen atom. And I sent her back with this ball of cotton, <laughs> this ball bearing. The other classmates, you know, who were asked to make the strontium atom or whatever, they came back with their beads. And the teacher looked at this and she said, Rachel, what is this? And my, my daughter was smart enough to say, my father says this is a hydrogen atom. <laughs> and the teacher said, a hydrogen atom only has one electron, right? And Rachel said, Yes, this is, this is trivial, <laughs> she said. <laughs> so she got an F on that assignment. <laughs> OK. Now, at this point, daddy goes to school to have combat. <laughs> this is what really happened with the teacher to try to, you know, the, my teachable moment is now transferred to another stage. <laughs> but my daughter had learned something, which is, Never, ever ask your father again anything <laughs> about chemistry or about <laughs> things of this sort. It, it only leads to trouble. So that was the end of that. <laughs> the, the other, the other uh, let's see what, uh, thing was what happened to Bonnie. My middle daughter, Bonnie, was uh, going at that time to school with a Rachel Golden, the daughter of David Golden, a person from SRI. This means something to some people in the audience, otherwise not. And the teacher took a candle and lit this candle. I could have brought this for you. And with a pan of water. And then put a glass jar over the candle. And as the candle burnt out, the water rose in the jar. And the teacher asked the class, why does this happen? And the class had no idea why this happened. And the teacher said, Come on, Bonnie, and come on, Rachel, you should know. Because your father, <laughs> you know, is supposed to know something about chemistry. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so that night, Bonnie came home and said, tell me why the water rises. <laughs> and I said, I really doubt your teacher understands why the water rises. <laughs> but let's, let's look at this, and I'm going to try to play for you now, if I can, a video. <coughs> so let's minus this. And um, I think you'll find this interesting. See if we can make this go. He's the Superman of science. And he loves to play with fire And the things he'll do, you can do If you so desire To try this at home with Mr. G Mr. G Whoa, hello, hi, welcome back to Do Try This at Home I didn't notice you sitting there 
I'm your host, Mr. G, and we're back with yet another really cool episode of Do Try This at Home, the show that takes ordinary household items and turns them into something extraordinary. <laughs> well, what I've got today is I've got a lesson in air pressure or atmospheric pressure. The atmosphere around us presses down on us at 14.7 pounds per square inch. I agree at so sea far. Level. <laughs> That's right. Our atmosphere weighs something. In fact, it weighs a lot. And here I'm not at sea level, I'm in Pleasant Home, Ohio, so I figure the atmospheric pressure here is about 14 pounds per square inch. You might remember me breaking that board in half with my stealth karate moves that was being <laughs> held down by just a sheet of newspaper. That's because the atmospheric pressure was pressing on the newspaper and kept that yardstick in place. Well, today we're going to demonstrate atmospheric pressure in a totally different way. What I've got with me today is I've got some birthday cake candles, I've got a lighter, I've got another candle, I've got, um, oh, uh, <laughs> there is one thing here that's kind of dangerous. I've got in a picture here, dihydrogen monoxide. Now, <laughs> you've got to be very careful if you're going to do this experiment at home because of the dihydrogen monoxide, extremely Actually dangerous. Water. <laughs> so, let's get started. What I'm going to do is, Died I'm going to light the candle, or I'm not going to light it, I'm going to melt the end of a couple birthday candles here. Easily do this at home. And I'm going to put them right on Santa Claus's eye in my Merry Christmas tray. <laughs> Found this floating up in one of my kitchen cupboards in the back there. You get a big tray like this. And after I got them adhered so they don't fall down, and after we've poked Santa right in the eyeball there with them, what we're going to do next is we're going to pour some of the dangerous dihydrogen monoxide. Notice the cool red color of that? Into the tray here. Okay. Actually, I added the red color to the dihydrogen monoxide. It's normally a clear liquid. Okay, what I'm going to do next is, first of all, let me explain something. Now that I've got that liquid here in this pan, the atmospheric pressure around us, again, 14 pounds approximately per square inch here in Pleasant Home, Ohio, is pushing down on that <laughs> liquid. Now, if we were able to somehow remove from somewhere above the liquid, some of the atmosphere, let's say 21% of it, because 21% of the air around us is oxygen, and oxygen is basically necessary and gets consumed when a fire is made. It's necessary for fire. 78% of our atmosphere around us is actually nitrogen gas, and then there's trace elements, a lot of argon. Anyways, let's light these candles. That's next. Be careful not to explode the uh, dihydrogen monoxide as well. Okay, here I'm sizzling. That's because on one of the earlier tries at this experiment, I might have gotten a little wet. But don't worry, they'll start burning here in a second. There, they dried up. Next, I'm going to take this strangely tall drink um, container. This used to care, it used to have some kind of water, flavored water in it. So look for a tall one like this, they work pretty good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. Actually, first, I'm going to take this strangely shaped glass. <laughs> and I'm going to put it over top of these two candles. Watch what happens. <gasps> wow, as the candles... Well, they're still rising. Again. That's all right. As the candles burned, <laughs> they took out about 20% of the atmosphere that was inside the glass. But out here, we still have that much atmosphere, the, the extra 20% of the atmosphere. So we've got more weight. The lower pressure inside the glass and the higher pressure outside the glass caused the atmosphere to press down on this liquid, pushing it up into the glass. Wasn't that cool? I thought so. I thought that was way cool, way cool. Okay, I'm going to try to get those candles to burn again, so let me get some of the liquid off the end of them. Because I'm going to do this again, but with a little narrow one. It's kind of cool because it goes faster. Your narrower container like this will actually, will, will, the water will be pushed into it at a faster rate. The water? Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I had you going there, didn't I? Dihydrogen monoxide. Just a fancy name for it. Simple water. Okay, here we go. We put, whoa, I don't want them to go out. There, we'll put that over top of it. Now watch this. <gasps> they are going to go out because it put them out. The, the water, the colored water actually put them out. So there you have it. Because we've got that weight of atmosphere pushing down here, in fact, I would bet that that's about a fifth of the height of that. Let's check here. One candle. Okay, so a little over right from the surface. One candle, two, three, four, and a little more because I, okay, there's one. <laughs> three, four. 
Yeah, maybe a little bit more because it narrows at the bottom. But that's about 20% of the volume of that of that container. That's amazing. So you've got to. <laughs> it is amazing. Um, that explanation is fantastic. <laughs> it, it happens to be quite wrong. <laughs> and to give you further reasons why that explanation is wrong, and I, I, I did this actually uh, for, for my uh, undergraduate class. I had them go to their dorms, not inside their dorm because we don't like fires in the dorm. I had them go outside and light a candle and do this in a pan of water and what, watch what happens. And then I had them light two candles and do the same thing. And with the two candles, the water went up even much higher, which if you removed all the oxygen, which incidentally you don't. The reason why the candle goes out is there isn't enough oxygen to support the, com the rate of combustion to make the heat. Turns out mice can live in the air after you've burnt up <laughs> the thing. It's not the void of oxygen. It's just been reduced. Just to mention to you, people have done those experiments. And I have another video to show you that, which I'm, I'm going to get to. Here, here we go. Let's just look at this one. If I can. Hope this will come up. Come on. Okay, let's pull this aside. Pull it so you can see it's bigger. And let's play it. Well, it may be loading. Watch what happens. Watch carefully now. Really, observation matters. Heating up this air all in here. Puts it over it. This goes out. When this goes out, this goes up even more. It doesn't go up evenly at all. It's a matter of this hot air cooling off. Okay? To have, it really has to do more than one effect is involved here. And I gave this to my class and asked them to discuss this. And it was very interesting. Some people found this really interesting, and it did dispel some of what they've often heard in high school about how things work. Others hated this experiment because they said, what's the right answer? You, you didn't tell me what the right answer was. How do I learn anything from this? And I said, well, this is, the, this is real life. This is why it's so hard to determine how much oxygen there is in the in air, that you can read accounts, and you have to do a lot to really figure this out, and it wasn't done this way, okay? And th things of the sort. Uh, and and I, I felt, again, you really can learn from this. And quickly, people separate themselves as so they, they feel OK with research or an uncertainty, or no, they always want certainty from this. OK, let's put this back away and go on. Uh, try to go on. That was my time out. So next, I thought I'd mention to you something about the importance of educational research in chemistry. Um, and so these are, first of all, similarities between research in chemistry and research in chemical education. They both start with a question, they define what needs to be understood better, and they design experiments <coughs> to collect data. And they analyze the collected data with the most sophisticated tools available, and they disclose fully the work in conference proceedings and peer-reviewed publications. Most chemists feel much more comfortable with research on chemical problems than research on chemical education problems. Why is that so? I mean, this is the reality, I think. And I'm not different in that either. <laughs> um, how comfortable are you with complexity and ambiguity? Generally, in chemistry you make things as simple as possible. Chemical education deals with people, and they're never simple or possible. <laughs> Um, chemists are drawn to the study of pure substances under conditions where they respond to the chemical system results in a linear change with the experimenter's variations of the initial conditions. But the scholarship of discovery, the scholarship of teaching and learning is not like that. It's really tough. Okay? And actually the chemical world is not like that either when you get more involved in detail. Lots of feedback. So my opinion, chemists are skeptical of chemical education research the same way that they are skeptical of all the social sciences. Okay? <laughs> trying to say how it is. Okay?
But this research area is not only valid, it also holds huge potential for practical gains in preparing the next generation of chemists. <laughs> okay. uh, nothing is more fundamental to the future of the chemistry profession than attracting the most talented young women and men to the pursuit of the chemical sciences and providing them with the education adapted to solving problems at the cutting edge of our field. Okay. So why do chemical educators fail to gain respect? <laughs> this question, right? <laughs> He who can does, he who cannot teaches, right? <laughs> George Bernard Shaw, the beginning of the disrespect. <laughs> or, um, okay. Uh, he who cannot teach, teaches teachers. That's the next one. <laughs> My reply, those who can do, those who cannot do not, those who can do and who can teach, do it all. <laughs> and, uh, I, th I think it's so, and, and, and we, can, we can aspire to, to all of this. This is just a certain comment about this. We don't have to just close our minds or our possibilities off, but they are different areas of research. Uh, so, so what's the problem? Why are we having so much trouble with this? And I think the findings of chemical researchers and chemical education researchers are often are described in separate jargons and published in separate journals. And therefore, while this is true, they're just talking to each other, and we have a communication failure. Houston, we have a problem. I've been waiting to say that, right? <laughs> and uh, I got involved, um, and I was asked by the American Chemical Society, let's talk about failure now. This is a, I'm going to describe to you a real failure, but a failure I care a lot about. I got involved in heading up a task force to see whether or not the ACS could do something about chemical education. I was told how important this would be. I was told that all the resources of the American Chemical Society would you know, put to make something happen if we could come up with things to do. I was lied to. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> and uh, charge the task force. OK, you can read all that type of stuff. Identify specific actions that the society can undertake in response to these recommendations. Create a priority list. OK, here are the people who served on this committee. You know, some pretty, pretty neat folks, people like Norm Augustine, who you don't associate with being necessarily <laughs> a person who's going to waste his time, uh, and other people, including people who are high school chemistry teachers, and people like Bruce Fuchs, who's been studying education at NIH, and a lot, lot of people here uh, that I thought were pretty neat, Shirley Malcolm, uh, many others, okay, that we could uh, point to. Uh, and. Uh, the task force charge extended across all levels of education. We looked into this and we came to the conclusion that the real lack in the U.S., and that's what I'm talking about right now, occurs in middle school, junior high school. Uh, high school, if you understand, beginning high school. We think that's a crucial time. We think if you can't get people interested in science at that time, they're not going to be interested in science from then on. They may become that have learned something more about it, but they're not going to be interested. That's the key time. And we think we're really failing there. Part of that failure is that the teachers we have who teach science, whether it's physics or chemistry, often don't want to teach physics or chemistry. <laughs> they're not been trained to, and, they're not, and they show by their body language how little they care about it, I'm sorry to say. Um, uh, the task force formed subcommittees and so forth. It, here's what we recommended. As a result of its work over the past six months, the task force recommends as its top priority an, an idea that I had, that the society creates a science coach program providing members of the ACS local sections with the resources to effectively support middle and high school science teachers and their students. The goals of this program would be to provide support to middle and high school science teachers with content such as um, interesting hands-on lessons and resources, and to offer an after-school enrichment program to students with an interest in science. And because education is fundamental to improving people's lives through the transforming power of chemistry, the proposed program fully supports the ACS vision by nurturing scientific inquiry and interest among primary and secondary students. That's what we were recommending. And then I talk about the elements of a coach program. Let me try again to make clear what I'm saying here. High schools have a football coach. They have a basketball coach. They have a swimming coach, depending if they have a swimming team, et cetera, and so forth. There's no reason they can't have a science coach or a chemistry coach. I don't care. You'll, you'll see where I'm going with this. To be an effective coach, 
you have to be on the team, on the, on the side of the team you're working with. If, and let me say who's in charge. Just as the coach is responsible to the owner of the football team <laughs> in the National Football League, the coach better be responsible to the teacher. It is not there to teach the teacher or to challenge the authority of the teacher. If they don't get along, the teacher fires the coach. They've got to be a team that work together. The coach can do many things. Who would be a coach? Turns out all types of people want to be a coach. That they vary who they are. Sometimes it's parents of kids in schools, or they've been kids in schools. Other times there's graduate students that are just eager for this responsibility. And if you think they're too young, we can have assistant coaches, I don't care. Or many people are retired, who come away from industry, have all this experience that they can use, want to give back. It doesn't cost much to make this program happen. I wanted to do this through the, hundred and, through the many hundred, hundreds of local divisions. I don't care whether this is done in chemistry or physics or biology. I hope you realize I'm, I'm interested in science. And I think we need coaches in our high schools. It's, a, to me, a really pressing problem today why we are failing in education. I've heard all types of things tried. Uh, I think we need a change. And I think if we could get parents involved, the way I'm talking about, that we will change the culture. And it needs, it's a cultural matter about how important it is to go into science. Uh, yes, it's easy to say you'll fix the problem by, pe by paying teachers more. I understand that, but I'm not trying to go that way. I, I don't know how to politically make that happen. Here's something I think we really could do. And I don't know what this says next. Provide coaches with a packet of experiments that are really interesting and affordable in order to create excitement and increase student interest. Train coaches in the use of materials and introduce them to the variety of resources. Compile a list of go-to resources, etc. It doesn't cost much. Create strong partnerships between the coaches and the teachers to ensure that the teachers feel supported, not threatened, in working with a coach. And uh, I think that this, this can be done and, and, and really would be a practical thing. I'd love to see this happen. Recognize teachers and coaches for their efforts in supporting science education. Well, I've taken this talk in perhaps a different direction than was ever intended, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate it. Uh, and only time will tell whether anyone ever wants to pick up this idea. Uh, I hope it resonates with some people here. Thank you very much for listening to me today. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Dick. Um, there's a lot in there, and uh, I want, we have some time for questions, and I just want to, can I, can I start and ask one thing, because you opened it up, and we were talking about it at lunch, and it resonates with us here because we've had some issues with impacts of enrollment growth on our labs, and so we were talking about philosophy of labs, and you know, what is the role of labs? You've mentioned that a little bit. Uh, and how do people that have labs that are being uh, in a crunch uh, with enrollment growth and in difficult economic times, what, are, what might be some um, creative ways to deal with that? Has Stanford had to deal with that? Oh, yes, very much. So I've been very much trying to put back labs that have been taken away to save money, as I alluded to in my talk in the beginning. You yeah. want labs. Um, you don't need much labs. You also want to make teams of people to work in the lab. You really can get a lot done by working together on a problem. Yes, some of it individually has to happen too, but you can also gain a lot from working together. And, and this, cost, this automatically deals with the question of cost. I don't think all labs have to be done in laboratories. I actually like the idea of doing labs at, at home, <laughs> in the dorm or elsewhere. I think they, you can design them to be safe. And I have a whole list of things you can do that way. Uh, uh, look, give you an example so you'll realize what I'm talking about. Um, uh, you can try to understand what it is that controls how fast an Alka-Seltzer tablet dissolves. Alka-Seltzer you can buy. The Alka-Seltzer company, whatever it is, takes the responsibility for the Alka-Seltzer tablet. So if you poisoned yourself with Alka-Seltzer, don't bother me. Go bother them. Okay? <laughs> I don't think it's a problem. Alka-Seltzer, you can try it in hot water versus cold water and find out which one causes it to fizz more. If you decide that the temperature of the water matters, then you could always run the water now at the same temperature. You can powder up the Alka-Seltzer tablet 
And look at it compared to a whole other source of tablet. Guess what? The powdered stuff just effervesces and it's over quickly, right? So it has to do with, with surface area. Then you can cut an Alka-Seltzer tablet in half. And you can race a half an Alka-Seltzer tablet versus a whole Alka-Seltzer tablet. And guess what? They come out the same. You can ask people to predict ahead of time what will happen. Then they ask them to observe. Then you ask them if they can come up with any explanation. And the answer, simple answer is, there's half as much area in a half an Alka-Seltzer tablet and half as much material. So it comes out the same as a whole Alka-Seltzer tablet. I think you learn a lot from this. And, and it's a way we can all get involved in, in doing things. I believe in this strongly. Uh, again, I really say to you, uh, working together, people teach each other, particularly, well, well, look, at the, look at the student experience. What do you get out of going to Rice or going to Stanford, I don't care, whatever, what do you get? You get, first of all, a seal of approval. I came, I'm a Rice person or a Stanford person of some sort, right? Go owls, go, what are they now? <laughs> Tree? <laughs> Cardinal? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, and what else? Uh, you really learn a lot from your classmates. If you think about it, the difference, uh, you, you, again, you get lots of education. And yes, the faculty matters, they do, and it's the interactions that matter. I think you can get this through, through, through labs. And I don't think it requires such a huge investment of faculty time to make some of this happen. But you have to decide you care. I, I hope I've given you some yes, answers. Thank you. Are there questions for, uh, for Dick? Let's let that microphone go to get to you. So you, you outlined for us your, the recommendation uh, that you came up with, and what was, what was the response to that? Pitiful. <laughs> the, the American Chemical Society uh, said that they couldn't uh, afford to spend more than $25,000 to try this program, and they've never implemented it, um, that I know much about. Uh, how did it flounder? It seemed to flounder because there was an argument between the uh, chair of the board of directors. Neil, you'll enjoy this. The chair of the board of directors said this was great. The executive officer said, this is terrible because whatever the chair of the board of directors wants, I don't want, <laughs> generally. And so it collapsed. And if you don't get certain people working together, guess what? And, and so it became a personality issue and not anything to do with the program. Uh, I really wish it could be tried. Would you say something about the use of simulations in laboratories? Sure. Uh, I think we can gain a great deal from, from even learning how to do simulations of things. But if we only simulate everything and never try with our own hands to see something, I think we, lo lo we lose out. So I'm not opposed to, to having some labs involving simulations or constructing them, but, but uh, and, and there's a lot to be learned. But I do like the idea myself at the moment that many doctors have cut up a cadaver before they cut me up as opposed to have done it on a TV screen. With a, now, there's some that are, that are progress that's being made with, with simulations as well about that. I'm not saying it's not possible, but uh, I do like some practical experience that come from it because you really get a sense of the real world that you don't seem to capture when you just make up a computer program to do it as well. And you learn, all you learn from using an electronic balance is that you need to put whatever you want away on the pan. Push the button. And push a button and you shouldn't put something that's hot or corrosive on the pan because that would be bad for the balance. Uh, is there any way of of moving back in time <laughs> uh, and, and doing these things where you actually see what, what the, the consequences of various uh, actions are. I, I personally do like experiments in which you can see every part of it and you can pick some that, that, that have that nature. Uh, however, uh, let me just talk about weighing things. Having used both the double pan balance and the electronic balance, I prefer to use the electronic balance. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, so I, I think we have to think hard about picking some right experiments. But 
if everything is, if it's really black box, then we don't learn. But we can make certain parts that aren't and, and then pay attention to them. I do have a story to share with you all about the Mettler balance, the electronic balance. I uh, teach uh, analytical chemistry to undergraduates, uh, being the only person in my department who uh, admits to doing analytical chemistry. <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, started by telling them about the wonderful work of T.W. Richards, how he was able to determine atomic weights to five decimal pl five places, five significant figures by weighing. And they were going to start by, by titrating a silver nitrate against a metal bromide to get the weight. And we we're going to try to see what went on to this experiment. Because I thought it's a classic to learn. And then we're not going to go back and do more burette stuff after that. That was my only titration experiment. And I explained to them how fortunate they were that they could use a Mettler balance. And I explained how it worked and that it would re read to the tenth of a milligram. And it does. Okay? And um, now comes the first lab, which that year shut down. How did it shut down? Well, the first indication that there was trouble with this lab was when the TA came running to my office. Come quickly, there's something wrong with the Mettler balance. So I came. Here were the beakers. It was a beautiful day in Palo Alto. Beautiful day, sunny day. Okay. Beakers gleaming, been cleaned. They are all at room temperature. I worried about temperature effects. They're wearing plastic gloves as they've been instructed so they don't put fingerprints on, the, on this. And one of my best students had noticed that the beaker was gaining weight on a Mettler balance and that asked the TA what to do. And the TA says, oh, try another Mettler balance. Well, it gained weight on that Mettler balance too. Now, on putting coins on the Mettler balance, it was fluctuated in that last digit but never gained weight. But the beaker was gaining weight and I didn't know what to do and it was real. I tried it. It's gaining weight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is, you know, nightmare for a course that's supposed to be about measurement and accuracy and so forth. A nightmare. So I said, okay, don't use what's called a tear. Don't, don't use the beaker which you weigh first, then put something into it, and then weigh it again. Use filter paper. Put filter paper down, pour your chemical in the filter paper, weigh it that way, and that's what we did. A kludge, which worked, got us through the lab, but lost an hour over this process. Now I'm upset. What's wrong? So I call up the Mettler balance salesman. And I said, have you ever heard anything like this? And he says, sure. He says, you know, you, you, you don't understand, Dick. Why don't you read the instructions in the manual? <laughs> what, <laughs> what are you talking about? He says, well, think about it. He says, was it really a beautiful day that day? I said, yes. He says, and you know what? The humidity was near zero, wasn't it? I said, yes. And he said, well. When you rub plastic on your glass beaker, you charge it up. And then it acts like a Cottrell precipitator. It takes the dust out of the air. <laughs> and because it can read to a tenth of a milligram, you can watch the thing gain weight. <laughs> oh, is that a bitter lesson. <laughs> and again, you learn from failures. My whole class has never forgotten. Again, that really did prove to be a teachable moment from failure as to what things are like in the world. So thanks. <laughs> Jim? Uh, this is maybe more of a comment than a question, but one of the problems, it seems to me, with having labs that are open-ended and are some fun and stimulation is that we're so caught up in the need to give grades. And yes. if, if you want to learn from failure, having grades is not, uh, <laughs> not a good aspect. And, and, and yet, here are these students who have got more things on their plate than they can handle. This is and true. if you don't give grades, they won't do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> How do you, have you ever run across that? Oh, have I ever? Okay. <laughs> have I ever been asked the question, "Will this be on the final exam?" Yes, I have. <laughs> it's, it's very true. And again, it, it, it's back to that we don't with grades simply measure all the right things, right? We, we know it. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Question? So let's get the microphone. Are we okay? Hi, well, I've been uh, here at Rice for 22 years. I came with, I came with Jim Kinsey uh -huh. uh, and been teaching undergraduates in our research lab, you know, for that period of time. And one thing I've noticed very, very striking is a spectacular decline in their ability in terms of simple mechanical things. Like, you know, what is a ceiling surface when you put two fittings together? You know, how do you drill a hole? Uh, you know, I literally putting nuts on bolts, uh, soldering a wire. So the thing is, it's almost as if, you know, the entire undergraduate population is decoupled from the analog world now. And I asked a student, actually, about 50, who had been there about 15 years ago, and he said, well, yeah, I was in high school 15 years ago, and that's the last time we ever had to open the box to make the computer work better. And so now the box is all sealed up, and, you know, it's, they've decoupled from the analog world, it seems to me. And I don't know, how do you reconnect them to the analog world? These are challenges. These are real challenges. Uh, and, 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 and yet, we want, that, we want some form of coupling. Now, there was a time very much when working on the farm made a huge difference, or tinkering with cars, okay? Uh, which tended to be what males did more than females, but, but nevertheless, this was really important. Uh, and uh, we need to find that, uh, whether it's with tinker toys, erector sets, or whatever, we need to bring, bring some of that back. It matters. Hmm? It's not allowed. It shows on the screen. Oh, I see. <laughs> Small objects may be swallowed, that's right. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, I think with that, uh, we'll invite you to come and join us at a reception out in front of Sewell Gallery. Thank you all for coming, and very special thanks to Richard Zare for being with us today. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you so much. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.